All right. So now that we understand what homonyms are and things like that, we can talk about ambiguity and the different types. So there's three types of ambiguity. The first one is lexical ambiguity. And that is when a word basically is a homophone or uh, represents um, homonymy between two different versions of the word. So my bat is one of the best things in the world. It is not clear to speakers whether you're talking about a baseball bat or an actual flying bat. We need context and frequencies of hearing these things in order to determine which one it is. Uh, we'll just leave this at the bank and then head out. Well, bank could be the place where you deposit money, or it could be a river bank. It's going to depend on the context, so until you understand what the context is, it's a lexically ambiguous sentence. Now, in each of these cases, these are both just nouns, and in terms of the structure, it's not going to change anything. The structure for either word you choose will be exactly the same. It's just what bat refers to or what bank refers to under that node that is going to affect the meaning. Now, structural ambiguity, we saw a little bit with prepositional phrases, but this is when we have more than one possible structure for a sentence. So young men and women dominate the country. Now, there's two ways to interpret this. One is that it's just young men and then all women. So we can see this in the left tree where young is just modifying men, it's just modifying one noun. And then young men forms with women to make a compound. But there's a second way that we can interpret this, and that is young is modifying both men and women. In which case, we want to form a conjunction for men and women first, and then we modify it with the adjective phrase. So for structural ambiguity in this case, it's just what is the adjective phrase modifying? Is it modifying a single noun or is it modifying an entire uh, conjoined noun phrase? The last one is scope ambiguity. And you'll see scope ambiguity with words like every and some when you have a subject and direct object that each use one of those different terms, or you see them with numbers. So if you have a number term in the subject and a number term in the direct object, and they are well, either similar or different, we see scope ambiguity. And what I mean by this is if we say four bodybuilders move two trucks, there's different ways that we can distribute this. Either there's four bodybuilders, and then each of those bodybuilders individually are going to be moving two different trucks. So that would look like the diagram on the left. So each bodybuilder is connected to two trucks, which means that there's going to be eight trucks moved in total. Or it could be the case for four bodybuilders move two trucks that each of them were doing them together. So four bodybuilders are moving the first truck, and then four bodybuilders are moving the second truck. So in total, there would be two trucks moved. So this is what scope ambiguity is. It's a little bit hard to demonstrate syntactically what's happening without some knowledge in truth conditional semantics. Um, but if you just remember the distribution of every and some or numbers, you're able to identify scope ambiguity. So let's see what type of ambiguity is apparent in each of these sentences. So every student loves some teacher. So here's how we can do this. We can say, okay, there's a bunch of different students out there and there's one particular teacher and every single student happens to like that one particular teacher. Or we can think about it as every student exists. And for each of those students, there's some particular teacher that they like. And maybe two people like the same teacher, that's okay too. But there's two ways to interpret the sentence, either every student individually loves some teacher or other, or there's a particular teacher that every student loves. And this is your example of scope ambiguity. If you can draw a little diagram like this with two different interpretations of how the arrows go, you're looking at scope ambiguity. Okay, two, I put the key behind the safe on top of the table. This, I want to argue, is structural ambiguity. Now, why? Because we have a prepositional phrase on top of the table. Now, you're putting the key behind the safe on top of the table. Is on top of the table describing where the safe is, or is it describing where the key is being placed? So maybe the key is just on top of the table and also behind the safe, or maybe it's just behind the safe which is on top of the table. So maybe the key is on a box behind the safe on top of the table. Now, for three, my ex girlfriend is looking for a match. Match could mean a physical thing that lights on fire when you strike it, or it could be a partner. So in this case, this is lexical ambiguity. There is an uncertainty of what match could refer to.
So now we can talk about sentence relationships. Those were word relationships before, and now these are sentence relationships. We say if two sentences have the same meaning, then they're paraphrases. So if we say Sarah greeted the police officer versus the police officer was greeted by Sarah, the content and meaning of these sentences are exactly the same. So these are paraphrases. I scored a perfect mark on the test versus I scored 100% on the test. A perfect mark in most cases would be 100%. So we're saying the exact same thing. The content is the same. So these are paraphrases. And how we can identify paraphrases is by joining two sentences together into one. And if it is a paraphrase, we, it sounds quite redundant. Sarah greeted the police officer, and the police officer was greeted by Sarah. Okay, we just said the same thing twice. This is redundant. So that's how we can identify paraphrases. For contradictions, we're looking at sentences that both cannot be true at the same time. So for example, I am a married man and I am a bachelor. If you're a married man, by definition, you're not a bachelor because a bachelor is an unmarried man. So these two sentences together form a contradiction. Or I am an only child, meaning you don't have any siblings. And then you say, I love my sister. Well, a sister is a sibling, so you can only be one of those two things. So those are examples of contradictory sentences. And if we combine them together, then the sentence will always be false. So I'm a married man and I am a bachelor. Uh, that's not semantically okay because you can't be both. We say a sentence is tautologous if it's always true. So in other words, the content doesn't really matter. It's just about the fact that given the sentence structure, yeah, of course, whatever you say has to be true. So if something is an animal, it must be an animal. Okay, yeah, that's always true. If you have an animal, then by definition, it's an animal. I will master Greek or I will not master Greek. Okay, like there is no in between. Either you've mastered it or you haven't. This is always going to be true. It's like saying, well, you'll get an A in this course or you won't get an A. It's like, well, yeah, that's given. That's how you grade. You either get an A or you can get something else. Uh, if I'm tall, then if I'm smart, I will be tall. So this is saying, if I'm tall, then if I'm smart, I will be tall. Well, the condition is already that you're tall. So it doesn't matter if you're smart after, because of course you're going to be tall. Anyway, you're already giving the condition of you being tall. So these sentences are tautologists. They're always true. Anomalous sentences are just semantically weird. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. These are not ungrammatical sentences, but there's issues with thematic roles that make it weird. So anomalous sentences are typically interpreted as metaphorical in a lot of cases. So the classic example by Chomsky is colorless green ideas sleep furiously. It doesn't make sense to have something that's colorless and green. It doesn't make sense for an idea to have a color. Uh, these ideas cannot sleep. And then obviously you can't sleep furiously. That's not, that doesn't make sense. So it's grammatical. It follows all the structural rules of English, but it just doesn't make sense. Uh, rocks denied the plaintiff a second chance. We have an issue here with the word rocks. Like, obviously, rocks can't deny things, especially in a court of law. And the idea that was taller than me wasn't good. Well, ideas don't have height, so this is weird. So these are all cases of semantic violations, and these are anomalous. So let's check to see if each sentence is contradictory or anomalous. So one, my personally employed butler was sad that I didn't have any employees. So we're saying that you employed a butler, but you don't have any employees. So this can't be a true sentence ever, because if you didn't have employees, you couldn't have a personally employed butler. So this is a contradiction. What about the summer picked a fight with all the winter leaves? Well, summer can't pick a fight and... Especially, it can't pick a fight with winter, at least literally. Metaphorically, this works. But literally, this sentence is anomalous because summer isn't an agent. Summer can't actively fight something. Uh, three, turtles hide in their mascots. There's something really wrong with this. I mean, this is kind of weird to say they hide in a mascot. So maybe we'd want to say it's anomalous with a question mark. But for the most part, there's nothing too strange about that. Now, the last thing we really want to look at in terms of sentence relationships are entailment. And entailment is when one sentence guarantees the truth of another sentence. So you can think of, I might say a bunch of statements and whatever entails from those statements is also true just by default. 
So I own one dog, one cat, and no other pets. That's sentence A. That entails that you own two pets, because if you add these things up, one dog, one cat, and no other pets, we get a total of two pets. So B is entailed by A. Now, in order to check for entailment, we can take sentence A, and we can take the negation of sentence B, combine them together, and if we get a contradiction, then we have entailment. Because it, if A entails B, then A should mean that B is true. So if we're saying A is true, but B is false, then yeah, we should get a contradiction. So I own one dog, one cat, and no other pets, and I do not own two pets. This is a contradiction, because we're saying one dog, one cat, that's two pets, no other pets, so it is exactly two, but then they're saying that they don't own any pets. Well, don't own two pets. So we get our contradiction there, which tells us that the first sentence entails the second. So let's see if we can determine whether or not there's entailment in each example. Kim will pass the test or fail the test. Does that mean necessarily that Kim will pass the test? Uh, no, because she could pass or fail the test. So it doesn't mean she's going to pass the test because she could fail it. What about in two? I have a brown pen and a red pen. Entails that I have a brown pen. Yes, this is entailment. I'm saying I have two of these things, so I can entail specifically that I have one of those things. I own at least four chairs. Does that mean that I own at least two chairs? And the answer is yes, because if you own at least four, then four is bigger than two. So you own at least two as well. So we could be a little bit more specific with these tests. So I can show the first one with the contradiction test. So we're going to take the first sentence, which is Kim will pass the test or fail the test and Kim will not pass the test. If we take a look at this sentence, it's not a contradiction. Kim will pass the test or fail the test, but Kim will not pass the test. That would imply that she's gonna fail it. So this is totally fine. And because it's totally fine, we're not looking at entailment. But if we do the test for our bottom one here, so uh, I own at least four chairs, but I do not own at least two chairs. Now this is very clearly a contradiction if we take the negative version of B. Because if they own at least four, then how do they not own at least two? 